I'm David Gibson, director of Fordham's Center on Religion and Culture. And um, along with Campus Ministry, we're your co-hosts for this special symposium, Does Faith Have a Future? God, Religion, and the Nuns. And again, just once and for all, when we say nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Sorry to get anybody excited. Now, the future of faith is something of an evergreen topic. My predecessors here at the CRC, Peter and Peggy Steinfels, did a, um, uh, a symposium, a day-long symposium, almost a decade ago, uh, rather happily called Lost. At least it had, a, um, it had a question mark after it, so there was some hope. Um, I thought I was being a little bit different with our title tonight. My other option was an update on the famous Time magazine cover, Is God Dead? But I thought that was a little too grim. <coughs> uh, when our email about this event first went out, uh, I received a response from Paul Lakeland, a great friend and doyen of Catholic studies at uh, Fairfield University who sent regrets he could not attend. But he also felt complimented because in 1999, 20 years ago, he gave a talk for the 50th anniversary of the journal Cross Currents, and it was titled, Does Faith Have a Future? The same thing. I'm just glad he didn't accuse me of plagiarism, but <laughs> yes, the point is, this is a recurrent issue, an issue of profound critical importance, not just for religion, but for our culture. And yes, it bears re-examining regularly because, frankly, the dynamics keep changing. The boomers become Gen X, which gives way to the millennials, which gives way to Generation Z, which gives way to whatever comes next. And while the boomers are repeating tired cliches about younger people, they themselves are changing in their religious attitudes and habits as we speak. We need to learn about these realities and face these facts before we go spouting off about what should or should not be done and who is or who is not at fault. So again, we're going to flip our program and we're going to start with the folks who have the ground's eye view and the literary talent to translate that into uh, spectacular writing and terrific punditry. Um, and again, we're also very grateful that you're here um, as there's a, you've sacrificed, some of you sacrificed watching the Yankees game. <laughs> and if you're a Mets fan like me, um, then you just wanted something else to do at, at, at all costs. Anything else would do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we promise to have you out of here before the NCL, NLCS game starts or the Democratic debate. Pick your poison. Um, in any case, um, uh, we have here on our panel, first uh, uh, to my left, Kaya Oaks, by way of Oakland, California, who has written widely on religion in the contemporary world. Probably best known is her book, The Nuns Are All Right, A New Generation of Seekers, Believers, and Those in Between. Also highly recommended, though, is her memoir, Radical Reinvention, An Unlikely Return to the Catholic Church. Uh, of Mutual friend of ours and writer Kathleen Falsani, also of California, the left coast, recently tweeted describing Kaya's latest uh, piece in Commonweal magazine as, quote, excruciatingly splendid writing. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Speaking of splendid, we also have Tara Isabella Burton representing the East Coast, and specifically New York, which was the setting for her wonderful and well-received first novel, Social Creature. Tara brings a keen spiritual eye to all her writing, and her upcoming book is Strange Rites, New Religions for a Godless World. It will be published in spring 2020. And finally, we have Ryan Burge, who comes to us from the heartland at the center of the country. He's an assistant professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University, who's published widely in academic journals and popular news outlets about the next generation of believers and non-believers. He, like all of them, has a great Twitter game. So if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter, and if you are, follow them. And he's a Baptist pastor, so real life experience 
from the pews. Each of our panelists will speak for a few minutes about how they see the dynamics of faith developing today, and then we'll open it up to questions and discussion. Let's start with you, Kaya. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. So if you, if you begin to not be able to hear me, just let me know. Actually, let me do this. Okay. Um, so I published um, The Nuns Are All Right in 2015, so I was working on it and writing it from about 2013 to 2014. Um, so what's changed since then is basically this, this, we're in the same religious landscape, which is that there's a decline in affiliation. I'm Ryan and Tara will talk about the same thing. I don't want to go through a bunch of statistical stuff because that's your gig. Um, <laughs> but uh, the bigger questions, so when the book came out in 2015, the bigger questions that emerged from discussions that I had at events like this and um, at other places around the country and fortunate, I was fortunate in 2016 to go to Rome and, and do a seminar with journalists there, um, is what are the spiritual systems people are using to shore themselves up in the absence of affiliation with institutional religion, which I'm, I think is much of what Tara is researching and writing about. Um, but I particularly cover the Catholic Church, and so in particular with the Catholic Church, what does it mean um, for the demographic makeup of the American Catholic Church to become a brown church and not a white church in many ways. So the reception from a lot of church leaders that I got to my book was two-sided. One, um, how do we reach people who've drifted from institutional religion in order to get them back? Um, and two, where did they go? Um, so the, what I, the response was less about why they left and where are they. Um, and so I think that the bigger question we need to examine as Catholics in particular is why did they go and, and be more concerned about that. Um, so I've also been watching what Bishop Barron is saying and writing about the nuns, and I sometimes get the feeling he's actually never met one of them. Um, <laughs> That there's no statistical evidence that a firmer catechesis, in addition to purchasing a lot of word on fire merchandise, is going to make the difference to retaining younger white Catholics in particular. He doesn't seem to be quite as concerned about Latinx, Catholics, etc. Um, there is um, just a sense in his, he's very concerned about uh, this issue of nuns. Um, but he doesn't seem to really understand, again, the question isn't why they left, but how to get them back. And I think, again, we need to go back to the first question. Um, so there's no evidence that this is Pope Francis's fault either, um, which seems to be the uh, accusation uh, in some quarters. Um, the decline among Catholics in particular actually began with Generation X, which is my generation of people in their 40s and 50s. And uh, we are the children of boomers who were themselves disaffiliating from the church. And then there's also the length of the papacy of um, St. John Paul II. And there was a lot of younger Catholics leaving during that, which I think people weren't paying attention to. And then all of a sudden noticed that there was no Generation X Catholics left, except me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so when you ask, when you talk to Catholics about why they stopped being Catholic, it's, it's primarily body issues. They feel the church doesn't treat LGBTQ people with sensitivity and they are very critical of the stance on women in many cases. Um, so the bigger question, I think that the question of how to bring people back is kind of irrelevant and focusing instead on better questions and focus on meeting people where they are when they do depart from religious affiliation. What are the spiritual longings that people are feeling in a time when anxiety, stress, and depression are at all-time highs, epidemic highs, among younger adults? And why don't these younger adults see religion as capable of answering those longings? There's also a general sense for many of us Americans under the age of 50 that the things that were secure for our parents' generation, we were just talking about in academia, 
um, the, the vanishing of tenure, the vanishing of home ownership, where I live in the Bay Area in California, you can't buy a house unless you're a multimillionaire. Um, the difficulty of career for journalists and writers uh, in particular, um, but for many young adults um, who have four or five part-time jobs rather than one full-time one. All these precarities exist, so why again doesn't, why isn't religion answering the questions of rootlessness and a sense of having been abandoned by institutions that many young adults are asking? I don't have an answer to that, by the way. I just wanted to put that question out there. If you spend much time around nuns, you hear many of the same things. Religion is too judgmental. It has too many rules. They aren't seen as individuals, but are viewed as a kind of formless mass. They have lost interest or just stopped believing. And one of the best ways to cope with that kind of particular spiritual ennui or sedia is to have more one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. And so uh, over the past year, I myself went and trained to become a spiritual director um, with the Jesuits. And I found that when I began to look for people to do direction with, I particularly reached out to people who were feeling like they were in the nun group. And I had this massive response, um, more people than I could possibly work with. And so I think that's very telling. I also have a piece coming out in America plug um, sometime in the next couple months on what spiritual direction in particular can do for nuns and, and religiously unaffiliated people and how it can serve to meet them where they are. So I, I welcome you to read that when it comes out. Um, but one source told me that as a nun, he found access to the Christian tradition through spiritual direction that he would not have found otherwise. And I just want to mention really quickly and then turn it over to, um, to my peers here uh, that the night before I flew in last night and got in very late, so excuse me if I'm a little incoherent and I'm also on West Coast time. Um, uh, the night before last, I went to see the musician Nick Cave perform in San Francisco and he's a rock musician in his late 50s. Um, his son died uh, about three years ago, and since then he has begun this thing on his website where people can ask questions, they write in questions, and it's become a real ministry. He's not Christian, um, and he's doing this tour where people go, and it was sold out at Davies Symphony Hall in San Francisco. All of his shows have been sold out. People ask questions from the audience, and it was very profound. It was actually a profound experience of a musician and performer doing spiritual direction with these secular questions about death and life and meaning and identity and sexuality. And it was incredibly moving and a really unique experience. So I welcome you all to look him up. His name is Nick Cave, C-A-V-E, and read about his current tour. So I just want to end on the better question that we should ask instead of how can we lure people back is where do we meet them and what do they need? So thank you. Well, I am an unapologetic quantitative social scientist. <laughs> I'm also a political scientist, so my answer is going to be a lot about politics. The cause of and solution to all our lives' problems right now is politics. In 1976, the largest religious tradition in America was mainline Protestantism. 30% of Americans, adult Americans in 1976, were mainline Protestants. It was literally the largest religious tradition in America 40 years ago. The second largest was the Catholic Church, about 25%. The third largest were the evangelicals, about 20% or so. The nuns were 5%, a rounding error, really. They were not part of the conversation. They were actually about the same size of the population that Jewish people were in 1976. The world that the younger generation is inhabiting, the world they're trying to figure out politically and religiously, does not look like the world that many of us came of age of 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Politically, it's changed dramatically. 
religiously, it's changed dramatically. The mainline church, which is what I'm a member of, the American Baptist Church, which is the mainline version of Baptist faith, has gone from 30% in 1976 to 10% in 2018. That means one in five Americans who was mainline Protestant in 1976 is now not a mainline Protestant. The Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, the United Methodist Church, the American Baptist Churches, all these kind of churches are the kind of churches that have seen tremendous declines. While at the same time, and this is the bigger point here, while at the same time, the evangelicals were 20% then, and they're about 22% now. The Catholics have gone down a little bit, maybe 3% or 4% over 40 years, okay? The religiously unaffiliated have gone from 5% in 1976 to 23% today. Mainliners have gone from 30% to 10%. The unaffiliated have gone from 5% to 23% all at the same time. While evangelicals have basically stayed the same and Catholics have declined a small amount. And I know I'm at Fordham, a Jesuit school, the Catholic audience, but I'll tell you, a lot of the religious, it's a zero-sum game, guys. It all has to add up to 100% every year. So if one went from 30 to 10, that 20 has to go somewhere, right? And when the nuns go from 5% to 23%, I, I, it doesn't take a statistical social scientist to tell you, a lot of those people who were mainline Protestant became religiously unaffiliated over the last 40 years. Now, the question is why, obviously. Which brings me back to the mother discipline of political science. That was a joke. So in 2018, the 20 largest Protestant denominations, predominantly white Protestant denominations, I looked at the 20 largest ones. So the Southern Baptist, United Methodist, Episcopal Church, on down the list. The 20 largest Protestant, predominantly white Protestant denominations in America, 16 of them became more Republican in the last 10 years. 16 out of 20. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, obviously the Southern Baptists, yes, yes. True. Non-denominational evangelicals, by the way, have grown 400% since 1976. Super Republicans. But what about the United Methodists, the largest mainline tradition in America? 18 million people. They've become more Republican over the last 10 years. Just six months ago, they had a big rally in St. Louis, a big a vote on gay marriage. They voted to not affirm LGBT people. So the thought of the main line being this moderate or even liberal thing, the data doesn't bear that out. Oh, the Episcopal Church, the one you all have heard about, the super liberal Mayor Pete, you know, old school liberal mainline church. Yeah, they're 5% more Republican today than they were 10 years ago. Mainline Protestant Christianity, all Protestant Christianity, has become more politically and religiously conservative over the last 10 years. 85% of people who attended a predominantly white Protestant church in America went to a church where Donald Trump's approval rating was over 50% in 2018. 93% of people who attended a white Protestant church in 2018 went to a church where Donald Trump's approval rating was above 40%, which is what the national average is. Which means that if you attend a white, predominantly white Protestant church in 2018, there's basically a 93% chance you're going to attend a church where Donald Trump is liked more than he's liked in the general public. So if you're a Democrat or even a moderate in modern America, and by the way, I don't want to leave the Catholics out, 2018 data, 52% of Catholics said they would vote for Trump again in 2020 among white Catholics. So let's not leave them aside. And white Catholics are getting more conservative over time as well. Um, the only thing that holds them back or holds them towards the middle is, the, is Latino Catholics largely bringing them back to the middle. White Catholics are becoming more conservative. White Protestants are becoming more conservative. And you're a, a white person in America coming of age at 20 or 22 years old, and you want to vote for a guy like Mayor Pete or even Joe Biden, you're going to go to a church where you don't find a lot of kindred spirits in the pews with you. There's this thing in sociology called the spiral of silence. It's this, this idea that if you're in the minority... You figure out really quickly you're in the minority, and so what do you do? You close your mouth. And you know what happens when, when people hear silence? They think it's complicity, 
right? Because you're not speaking up against us, you agree with us. And the problem is the spiral of silence has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. So unfortunately, I think a lot of this problem and a good deal of this problem is the fact that American Christianity, by and large, has become conservative, Republican Christianity. And there are lots and lots of people in America who aren't Republicans. And when they think about religion, they think about the secular left and the religious right. And they don't fit in either camp. So on Sunday morning, it's easier just to not show up. So when we think about these problems, we have to think about them in the larger context of what's going on in our world, not just in the pews, but the ballot box, because both those things interact with each other. So when I talk about the, um, the religious nuns, which is not a term I particularly like for reasons I'll talk about in a second, I often think about um, a poll that was taken um, in 2017 by um, Vice's um, branding partner agency called Virtue, um, which I think is itself already interesting. <laughs> um, and it was a poll taken of millennials of um, what was important to them in brands. And, and I, I might be off by a percentage point or two here, but roughly, I think it was 54% of respondents said, I want a brand that is good for my soul. 74% said, I want a brand at least that conforms with my values. And to me, that statistic was fascinating, not simply because um, it speaks to the way uh, more broadly in which consumption and commodification of religious identity has become uh, a broader uh, phenomenon, particularly, I'd say, on the so-called secular left, but also more, more broadly in America. But also that there is, within the uh, demographics that we often uh, consign to sort of, they're the secular ones, they're the nuns, they're the nothings, um, a profound spiritual hunger. Um, one of my, the statistics that interests me most, so uh, just a sidebar for um, millennials uh, and for Generation Z, um, the number of the, we have, um, the religiously unaffiliated goes up to about 36%. So 23% is the national average, but we're, we're seeing you know, almost 40% of, um, of millennials and Generation Z identifying as religious nuns or unaffiliated. And among uh, queer people, I think that number is 45%. So you have this huge block that it's quite easy to say they're, they're nothings, they're nuns, you know, they're, they're secular, they are not religious, and we don't think about them when we think about um, ritual or meaning making or community or senses of purpose. Um, and we, at most, maybe we think, okay, some of them like do witchcraft and some of them do yoga and that's kind of weird, but they're, they're just sort of picking and choosing in a way that is um, kind of doesn't tell us anything broader about whether there is sort of a wider spiritual culture. And um, I think that that's, that's profoundly incorrect. I think, first of all, it's worth saying that about 72% of the um, so-called, or the self-identified religiously unaffiliated say they believe in a higher power of some sort. About 20% say they actually say they believe in the Judeo-Christian God. Um, so I think what is interesting to me then is we are not necessarily talking about atheists or agnostics. It is true that um, atheists and agnostics do tend to under self-report. So I, I'm not saying that there are, there are that all of the 72% necessarily kind of thinks very strongly about a higher power. Um, but there is an enormous uh, number of people, particularly, and my research deals more with millennials and Generation X, who see themselves as spiritual persons, who have a spiritual hunger, who want act like who self-identify as seeing this spiritual identity extremely important to them. Um, and my question, the question that I want to answer both in, in my book and more broadly is, is what is that? Can we speak of maybe not a formal codified religion, but religious strains, ideological strains within that group? Um, I joke a lot when people ask me what my forthcoming book's about. 
It's called Strange Rites. It's out in April. Um, but I joke that it's about, you know, it's about witchcraft and soul cycle and the internet. And that's the flippant answer. But the slightly less flippant answer is that I believe that you can see within the, what I call the religiously remixed, uh, a group that comprises both the spiritual, not, but not religious, but also people who might check a box um, saying that they're Christian or Jewish, but whose spiritual traditions are more eclectic. Um, that there are sort of, th there are some elements that we can see sort of commonality, um, or sorry, we can see elements of commonality um, among a lot of these remixed. And I think that a, a and Kai, you've spoken to this failure in many ways of institutions or a sense of precariousness that institutions are not um, trustworthy, we cannot, uh, rely on sort of social, political, often ecclesiastical institutions. Um, and there becomes this sort of sense in, this is um, that there is, the self is all that we can rely on, that our emotions, our intuitions, our desires, um, our sense of the world is, if not totally authoritative, then at least a better guide to um, how to live and how to live well than outmoded rules and outmoded restrictions. Um, I think you can see that in the cult of wellness and the way in which focusing on the self, the language of authenticity, often the language of energy, which is used in everywhere from soul cycle to your yoga class to um, branding on um, meditation apps like Headspace, that there's some sort of energy within us that we are uh, called to either manifest, there's good energy and ma bad energy, and we have to harness it in a certain way. The, the ways in which we take care of our bodies, of our skin, of our diets, um, somehow feeds into a, a vision of perfection of our own selves that is in accord with uh, our own spiritual well-being. Being. To take care of ourselves is to be authentic, to listen to who we are. Um, we can see that in kind of the increasing willingness on behalf of many of these religiously remixed to mix and match, to say, I want to make my own religion. I am, there is something, you know, I want religion to, to speak to me personally if I'm mixing tarot cards and sage cleansing and yoga, but also Shabbat dinner. Um, this is a more authentic and therefore good iteration of religious experience. And I think it would be very easy to kind of say, oh, kids these days with their selfies and they're just focused on themselves. I don't actually think um, that is the case. I think for starters, within the American religious landscape, you've seen um, pretty much since the founding of America itself, a constant dynamic tension between institutionalism and religious intuitionalism, both in kind of the various waves of Great Awakening, but also in the development of uh, 19th century theological crazes like spiritualism or new thought. There is something profoundly American about the idea that there, the internal component of your spiritual experience is extremely important. Uh, a, a tension that's often kind of existed in dialogue with the um, intuitional, uh, intuitional institutionalism and um, civic-minded religion, religious attitude you find in kind of the mainline Protestant tradition. And I think that so, can I go over? Wait, no, we're back, we're good. Um, <laughs> I'll wrap it up. Um, but also, also, I think it's, it's important to, if, to, to talk about, and I think this goes back to Kai's very well-made point, that if people think that they themselves, their own atomized individual selves and emotions are all that they can rely on, then every other institution in their lives has profoundly failed. Um, I think it would be easy to say, you know, oh, someone's focused on wellness and selfies, they're so selfish, but I see the kind of rise of an intuitional and self-focused culture as emblematic of the notion that the self is for a number of people who feel, for various reasons, uh, left behind by traditional social institutions to be um, a very natural, um, a very natural conclusion. If you are all you can rely on, why shouldn't this be the way that you approach the world? So, thanks.
Thank you, Tara and Ryan and Kaya. Um, again, just for those of you who may have walked in, we had flip our program, so we're going to have our panel discussion first, and then we're going to have Alan Cooperman from uh, Pew Research present his data. In between, we're going to have a wine and cheese reception, so you can stretch your legs and stretch your mind as well. Um, we're going to have now a question and answer open to all of you. Um, I just want, as we're going to have a couple of my colleagues who have microphones, so just raise your hands, please, um, and, and feel free to ask uh, and wait for one of our, uh, Nick or, or David, to come by with a microphone and speak clearly into the microphone any question you have for our panelists. I'll take moderator's privilege, though, and just throw out the first question. My, it, it, Tara, you brought up there one of my um, young man, favorite young man searching novels was Walker Percy's The Movie Goer, and had that great quote, which I always remember, Binks Bowling, the search is what anyone would undertake if he were not sunk in the everydayness of his own life. And I'm, I often think of that on two aspects related to what we're talking about. One, um, is that true? Are people today really interested in the search? You seem to say yes, and I'm not so sure. And two, um, if they are, where does that, if there are no institutions they trust, where does that search end up? Soul cycle or what? Um, you first. <laughs> gosh. Um, when, I, I do, I mean, maybe I am optimistic, but I do think, I mean, I think that the search for, I, I would divide perhaps the search for meaning, the search, let me start over. Religion, I think, if I if to say this hunger for religion means so many different things. And I don't want to kind of reduce religion simply to a hunger for meaning or a hunger for personal purpose or a hunger for ritual or a hunger for community. But I think that all four of those things under the sort of single banner of a hunger for religion are integral parts of what it means to be a person. I, don't th I think that, if anything, the kind of... Um, the realization that these things cannot be taken for granted. Community cannot be taken for granted. Um, a sense of meaning cannot be taken for granted in the sense that you're not necessarily growing up with um, a story about who you are, the world, and your place in it that um, you're, you affirm in thought and word and deed and how you live your life means that there's a kind of potentially constructive instability of, well, these are things I, 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 I need, these are sort of elements of, of who I am, I have to go out and find them. And I think that there is, um, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, a, a real curiosity and a willingness to say, I'm going to go uh, down the rabbit hole and find something that is spiritually valent. I think at its worst, and this is something that I am often critical of, it can turn into a kind of like, play, oh, I'm just going to put down $40 on a soul cycle class, and there, there's my spirituality checkboxed. And I think that certainly, some, because so many of the, re the, the, the religious traditions, or that we could call the spiritual traditions of the, the nuns or the remixed, are quite commodifiable, be it a yoga class, be it the you know, $42, which you could briefly buy at Sephora. Uh, Sephora, apparently, is how you say it. Uh, Sephora. Um, it, it is possible, certainly, for people to buy their way in without a genuine curiosity, but I think that's something... I mean, that is, a, that is not a charge that you could not also lay against people who say, well, I'm just going to come and go to church on Sundays and check that box anyway. Mm. Um, I do think that, be it wellness, be it... Um, the kind of modern witchcraft that has become um, increasingly uh, a part of often feminist discourse, often progressive discourse, um, often um, kind of other spiritual but not religious discourse. Um, that is sort of one avenue you can end up in is say, yes, I, I want to, I, I may not want to go to church or I don't want to go to synagogue, but I will light candles in my home and with the you know support, often online support of my, my friends or colleagues on Instagram or, or Tumblr, um, I want to take part in something meaningful. I will you know, have a, a, pr a political prayer or a personal prayer. I will direct my energy in this way. Um, I think there are, there are so many options 
for someone who, if you are to believe, I have this hunger, I should go fulfill it. And the way by, the yardstick by which I measure whether or not this is good, whether this gives me a, a feeling of spiritual well-being. Um, there are many ways uh, to, uh, to assuage that feeling or to satisfy that hunger. Mm. Ryan. I think the key word you said there was trust, though, right? I mean, I think that young people are incredibly cynical about everything in modern American life. I mean, we know in the data that trust in government was actually pretty strong until about 1973 or 1974, when then Richard Nixon happened. <laughs> and then everyone goes, yeah, we can't trust any of those guys with anything ever again. I mean, they're, they're rotten to the core. And so now... Oh, Tennessee, we fixed all that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Problem solved now. No problem. <laughs> But, I mean, it's just the hits keep on coming, right? We see the media scandals, the Brian Williams is, you know, making up stories. But then we see, unfortunately, the Catholic Church pedophilia scandal and, you know, the Chronicle. The Houston Chronicle ran a, a great story about um, independent Baptist churches and their, and their problems with sexual assault and sexual violence. As a Protestant, I'm shocked we don't have more of that. Like, I know what's happening. We just don't have the, the organization to kind of root it out and ferret it out because it's mm -hmm. so individualized, right? But I think I was asked one time, like, what do I think the future of Scientology is going to be? The Internet killed Scientology. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because people saw, like, the reason Scientology worked because they kept all the secret knowledge inside the little secret envelope that you only got when you got to a certain level and paid all this money. Well, when that got out, everyone goes, yeah, Scientology, oh, no, we're not doing that it's anymore. fascinating, yeah. You know, and I think that's what's happened with American religion a lot is we don't hear this. Uh, moderates don't march. Right? We don't hear the story about my church feeding 275 kids a brown bag of food every weekend. And we do, by the way. Mm. What we hear the story is about that idiot pastor who said that gay people were going to hell and that hurricanes are God's judgment against them. Right? Mm. So we don't hear people working in the trenches every single day doing the work of the church. What we, I call it the offensive lineman problem. You guys know in football, the offensive line are the guys who block to make sure the quarterback's not sacked. You know when you hear the offensive lineman's name on Sunday? When he missed his block and the quarterback gets sacked, mm -hmm. right? When he does his job, no one talks about it. When he screws up, that's all you hear about. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 99.9% .9 of churches and pastors are blocking for the quarterback every single Sunday. And the one time they mess up is the one thing that we always remember right? And that trust just erodes and erodes and it feeds the story and it feeds the cynical downward spiral. And it's just so much easier to be cynical than it is to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. And we just feed on this culture of cynicism. Um, let's go to some questions. Right here, David. Yeah. Hi, uh, Christine DePasqua. I'm a religion journalist. I remember in, um, I think it might have been 2012, the Rise of the Nuns report came out. I was reporting for a, a, a site called urbanfaith.com and um, noted the <coughs> stats were different for communities of color. I, Ryan, I don't know if I missed this. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to where those communities are now in terms of their uh, religious affiliation, young people in yeah. particular? So um, we'll look at the, big, the four big religious groups, like white, Asian, black, Hispanic, Latinx. Um, Asians at the highest level of religious unaffiliation, religious, uh, they're typically about 30%. Um, whites are around 25%, and then African Americans and Latinos are lower than the national average, right? We know that, but there's something interesting going on in the data with African Americans, by the way. Younger African Americans, it used to be the more education they got, the more they attended church, and now in the last generation that stopped that as African Americans are getting higher levels of education now, those under the age of 45 have not increased their church attendance anymore, which is, a, to me, a leading indicator that you're going to see a massive shift in the religious affiliation of African Americans in this country, which, speaking politically, is a huge deal um, for the future of what African American faith looks like in America. So um, Asians, number one, whites, number two, and then African Americans and Latinos below that. Um, yeah. Sir. I hope I'm more than a nominal Catholic. 
Um, I'm a peripatetic Catholic, and one of the interesting things that many of our pulpits, are, our pulpits are delivering palbum, palbum, or palbum, yeah, palbum. Palbum, yeah. The prophetical message seems to be lost. In Romans, Paul says, study the scriptures. Maybe certainly look at the life and the teaching of Jesus. And that challenge is not out there. The, was, your statistics, Ryan, were very upsetting that 50% of, of our congregations would vote for Trump. They bought a pig and a poke because he promised to be anti-abortion, a man who was, for his entire life, was pro-choice. Now he's become pro-birth, but he never said, I'm pro-life. His vice president walked by the cages in which the children were sitting on the floor had not received sanitary uh, equipment to clean and to uh, wash up and so forth. And he's backed up this man. And 50% plus of the population is supporting him. Where was the, in, where's been the preaching in our church, the Pope, Bened uh, Pope John Paul Benedict, and reaffirmed by Francis, certainly in Laudato Si, about being pro-life. And the prophetical has been lost, and you say the young people are cynical. Because we're not showing the authentic connection between the spiritual, our, our connection to Christ, and how we witness. Is that, uh... And the most vibrant churches I see here in New, in New York, especially in Manhattan, are those who have had the horizontal dimension of their faith. And perhaps the same is lacking in the Protestant denominations. Uh, We've, we've sold out. We didn't press pro-life, we just pressed pro-birth. And that, that is that where we lost with, credibility. Uh, any of your experience in the sense of not walking the walk, just talking the talk? Um, well, let me take this, this one, because I'm, I'm the Catholic here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one of them, yeah. <laughs> one of them, David. Um, and then we have an Anglo-Catholic, too. So, um, but I'm leaving now. Good <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to answer your question and say I agree with you. I think that, but I think that the danger is that um, the institutional church is not the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ is all of the people. And um, whenever I go to Rome, I'm reminded of this because there's, there's one pope and a billion of us. And I think that the prophetic voice of the Catholic Church is often in the laity, and unfortunately we don't have a very loud microphone. Um, and so that's sort of like my job as a writer, and I think many of my colleagues, and um, including uh, my, or I was at the offices of America today and, and just talking to some of the Jesuits that I work with and for their that they've been very good about helping people like me to have a career, you know, which would not have been possible for a woman um, who teaches at University of California, Berkeley, to write about the Catholic Church uh, a generation ago. And so while that kind of change is very minuscule and probably not enough for many people who have walked, I think that that call to accountability is very important. Um, for lay people to hold the church accountable. Um, but I also agree with you that the preaching is terrible in many of our churches. Um, and I live in the Bay Area. Um, the churches, the preaching is just dire. Um, and there is no call. And so I think that that's missing. Where is the message that is going to call? I don't want to say it doesn't. To, to bring people kind of back to life in some ways that they've become kind of numb because they are not hearing something that's making them care about what you're talking about. So anyway, long story short, more people who are Catholics should be writing and preaching and speaking. And, and unfortunately, we're not being encouraged in that. And so what I think that's what we need to call the institutional church to do, is to giving us more of a voice. Uh, it didn't work in the last generation, and so I think the next couple of generations are going to have to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Do you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, I want to add something. Tara, yeah. I, I think that to, 
It is absolutely true, as you said, that there is a sort of failing to to walk the walk that we see on the part of institutional churches. And I think one of the ones that sort of we've been explicitly and explicitly talking about here is the a lot of the way in which American Christianity and Republican Party politics have increasingly become intertwined. But I think it's also true, and this is something that I, I often see in, in liberal churches as well as perhaps some conservative churches, but as, as someone is is... I think once, once the metaphysics of an account of um, God or the good or the actual stuff of faith um, received an importance talked about less, um, which is something um, I certainly grew up with. I, I grew up Christmas and Easter Episcopalian, and the um, ethos where I grew up was sort of be a good person, but you know, the resurrection, like probably didn't happen, don't worry about it. And I think that some the, the danger of that kind of theology in many ways, or a kind of theological understanding that is that little bit um, loose, at a certain point, if your entire um, religious identity rests on the idea that you have to do things that are sometimes hard. And the reason that you do these things that are sometimes hard is that the structure of reality is about it. The, this is the most important thing of the world, in the world. Then if it's not true, then why does it matter? And I think that's something that I would like to see more particularly uh, progressive churches in my, own, um, in my own denomination do, or churches more broadly in my own denomination, like, really churches with any political affiliation, is go back to saying, there are many ways theology, of course, can be interpreted. But I think that in my experience, I often find that aren't interested in theology at all, which then leads you to wonder why you're in a space for theology rather than just going to therapy on Sundays. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, we use, use it that one going forward, yeah. Hi, I'm Doug Laurie. I'm a professional actor and a retreat leader. And uh, Thomas Merton said that the spiritual life uh, is the life of man's real self, the life of that interior self. And Tara, you mentioned the internal component of spiritual experience. And Kaya, you referenced um, a non-Christian rock star speaking intimately to the interior life of the people that were gathered in community at that, at that concert and, and the success you found in spiritual direction, which of course is geared profoundly to the intimacy and interiority of, of a person's spiritual life. And then Ryan, with regards to politics, the idea of externals, right? Po po the political external and how when it does speak to the interior, it manipulates the most vulnerable parts of us. It preys on our interior fear, our doubt. And I'm wondering if, if that component um, with regards to faith, the interior component has largely been ignored, and I see it as an increasing, uh, evol it's been evolutionarily ignored from generation to generation. Generations more and more have needed to have their interior life spoken to, have needed to find a deeper meaning in their existence within their faith traditions, and we've increasingly lost the capacity to do that. And I'm wondering if you've, you've encountered that within all of the denominations, that the pastoral essence of speaking to one's spiritual life largely doesn't exist in religious education. It's not, it's not present. And in part, maybe because the, sem the seminaries weren't teaching it themselves. They were preparing people for a moral life in church to believe certain things, but to not explore their own interior life. And when that happens, what are we seeing? Depression, doubt, distrust, all of the components that reflect and ignored interior life. There's one thing I think about a lot is, is how people, this is what political science is, we try to figure out what, when someone goes in the, in, the, in the voting booth and hits the button, like what's going on up here when they hit the button. That's literally my job, which drives me nuts thinking about that. Like, could be they just like the guy's haircut and they put the button, right? Or it's because they have some sort of deep spiritual sense, right, or, or calling towards one candidate or one party or whatever. And, and there's this interesting thing that's been going on in political science. In the last couple of years, there's a lot of folks who do religion and politics who have begun to 
sort of rethink how our inner self projects to our outer self, and especially in, the, in voting behavior. The, the, the assumption that we always made in the literature was that we looked at the world, our lens that we looked at the world, our worldview, our paradigm was a religious worldview, right? We, we thought about, okay, what would Jesus do in this situation? What would my church teach me to do in this situation? What does the catechism say? Or what does the Torah say about this specific issue? And then we would go to the ballot box and we would reflect our faith, our spiritual inner self at the ballot box. Yeah, that was cute. Um, we, we've sort of come around to this idea that now in American life that the religious lens has now been replaced by the political lens. And so now we don't look at the Bible in, we look at the Bible in a political way, right? We read the scriptures, the Torah, in a political way, which is that if I identify as a Democrat, I then look at the Bible and the parts of the Bible that reinforce my worldview, reinforce my candidate, reinforce my way of thinking about policy, and therefore I can make my religion into whatever I want it to be because my first lens is not any more religion it's politics. You know, politics has become religion in a lot of ways. And if you don't believe me, go on social media for five minutes. Um, people are so, I mean, orthodox Republican or orthodox, I want to say, do you not disagree with your party on anything? <laughs> and are you not worried by that? You know, like that, to me, that is evidence of this disease that we have is that our partisanship has become everything around us. And that spiritual life has been neglected or subjugated, both consciously and unconsciously, by the way, um, by the 21st century news media and the constant cycle of Giuliani, Trump, scandal, Biden, you know, it never stops. We never hear about the higher things in life. Can I just jump in with a, uh, an observation regarding, you know, millennials especially, and there's so much focus on, on, on young people, though older people, the older generations that we hark back to seem to be afflicted by these things as much as anybody. But if you look at the data, millennials, they're lonelier than others, fewer friends. The um, highest percentage of substance abuse problems, and, and they're the ones who have the fewest connections to organized religion, the, uh, their economic prospects stink. Um, they're kind of, the younger generations are not, just not talking about climate change. I mean, what is gonna happen is, does, would that portend perhaps a return to religious faith as something to make sense of what looks to be an increasingly fragile world? Or will that just throw them into deeper cynicism? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's any evidence that, that people, that there's a, a much of a return. You know, I, at least in, I don't know if you've seen in your research, like, either of you, I, there's almost no data that, um, that people who depart uh, come back. Um, it's, it's kind of the exception, right? And I think going back to your question about the interior life, I mean, Merton was from a generation that was able to access um, that because, I mean, frankly, when you read Seven Story Mountain, he had a lot of free time, you know, <laughs> honestly, like, and <laughs> he did. I, I read that book and I, I think like, how did, you know, he had so much time and I've been to Gethsemane, I've been to his hermitage. I know like how he lived. He had all day to just write. And he did a lot of praying, he did a lot of praying but you know, in between he was a prolific correspondent and writer. And so, so he was writing letters at the same rate, rate that maybe our, people that we're writing about and thinking about are tweeting and Instagramming and Merton was using the epistolary form to foment his friendships and relationships and his affair with a woman and and so you know he's an interesting example of somebody who was both a contemplative and had this longing for the world and so but he lived in a time you know he had a lifestyle where he could um, just think about God a lot and um, that is not a luxury that I would say most of us have, you know, in today, so. Yeah. I'd also be wary of kind of completely divorcing these sort of, there, there is the religion that is completely about the internal self and the religion that is simply about the tribe and the story. I think, yes, there are, there are different components to religious identity, but they're 
it, it is a much more dynamic relation than simply I have my internal state and then I have what I put on a form and then I have who, who I go to dinner with on, on uh, Friday night or, or Sunday brunch after church. I think that often the, uh, a sense of self of who I am and who I am in the world is a kind of constant negotiation between the interior self, which is not just what set of propositions do I believe about God, the world, ethics, but also who am I in relation to my community? Who are my peers? Who are my kin? What is my purpose vis-a-vis -vis them? And I think often, while it's true that, that sort of the way in which contemporary I, remixed culture sort of starts with the self more and says, who, who, you know, what am I feeling at this moment? What is authentic to me? Often that spills over very naturally into the finding of a community, the adoption of a different, perhaps quote unquote more authentic in the words of those who would, who would take this on, a uh, community that doesn't necessarily look like a church per se. I mean, to go, ba go back to, to the Soul Cycle example, which just because I love them, uh, I, I don't love them, I, I love them as an example, um, <laughs> is you know, they, they, above every Soul Cycle studio, there are flashing uh, neon lights that, that say, you know, we are not simply a group, we are a collective, a soul, a cult, a tribe. You know, you, your sense of, of the, 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 the sort of personal aspect of I am doing something for myself because the best way to be in the world is to take care of who I am, to achieve some kind of harmony. And the idea that I am one of these people who comes together and maybe we're riding in the dark and the energy is, is all, you know, and they even say, you know, on these, uh, on these studios, there will be a little sign saying your partner's energy is affected by your energy, so don't use your phones. And to sort of come into this world, and sure, is it is it the same totalizing thing as saying, you know, I I am a Catholic? No, but I think that it is still, in some way, formational to a person's sense of self. I am the sort of person who does this. These are the other sorts of people who do, do this. This is who I am. So I think to to talk about religion, you know purely interior religion and purely exterior religion is to dismiss how often they bleed into each other. David. Uh, good evening. Uh, I just had a question regarding the reasons for religious affiliation and uh, a while ago that discussion about the decline in different religious denominations and then um, how that seems to be correlated also with a more conservative uh, movement in different religions. So I wanted to ask if uh, the research um, any of you made like had uh, anything that showed material or economic factors that might have played into that. Yeah, there's some there's some data out there, especially uh, there was a piece in the Atlantic a couple weeks ago about how um, uh, high school educated white men have abandoned church. And actually the data bears that out. There's sort of this the people who really scare me are like the, the people in their 40s and 50s who don't have a lot of social connections because those are the people that religion would do a lot of social good for, these problems of loneliness and drug addiction and all these things. But at the same time, are those the same people that are dropping out of church at an alarming rate? Um, there's this book in, in, by Robert Putnam, uh, Harvard political scientist, 1990s. He wrote a book called Bowling Alone. Um, where he argues in 600 pages of charts and graphs that America is not joining stuff anymore, like the, the Elks and the Moose and the, you know, all the fraternal, or the, the American Legion, those things like that. And we don't join bowling leagues anymore. We bowl alone. Um, and his uh, culprit, his victim there, his, the, the reason this is happening, this is 1990s, he said it was cable television. <laughs> yeah. Sounds quaint. Right? Um, I think our generation, and by the way, this is not just a young person's thing. I think old people use social media way more than what we think they do, is that we now tweet alone and Facebook alone and Instagram alone and TikTok alone and Snapchat alone. And, you know, we don't do things together anymore. And I think that a lot of the problems that we're seeing in these, these people disaffiliating, especially lower income people who are disaffiliating, have less friends as a, as a, as a rule, kind of generally. And then when they, when they pull back from church, that that cuts off one of the very few social ties they can have to a larger community. And I think for a lot of them creates this downward spiral, right? 
Because church has a very interesting social function. That is, if you're in prayer circle or prayer time and go, hey, my husband lost his job. God works in mysterious ways because the guy down the hall from you goes, oh, wait, the guy from my church needs a job. I can get him a job right now. Right? And if you lose those social ties, you lose that opportunity to be back in employment. Right? So I think all those things as a social scientist and also a pastor scare me to death that the people who need church the most are the ones who are dropping out of church the most all at the same time. Mm. What? Oh. John, first, yeah, let's go to John. Two, two quick questions, if we can, yeah. And then you. No, no, let me do one up here. One, two, and three. Yes. What is the correlation of children at home and church involvement. I'm speaking to the issue of natality. I'm looking at the stats. Okay, okay. So there's this thing called the life cycle effect, okay? Which is this sociological idea that when you're a kid, you go to church a lot because your parents make you go to church a lot, right? Like, you got to be, that was me. Like, it's Wednesday night, let's go to church. Um, and then whenever you kind of move into adult, early adulthood, 18 to 29, 35-ish, you sort of drift away, right? Because you don't have uh, that, that structure anymore and you're trying to like be rebellious and like find your own way in life and stuff. And then when you have kids, get married, have kids, what do you do? Well, you want your kids to have the same moral foundation that you did, so you bring them back to church. And then your kids turn 18 and graduate and go off to college and what do you do? Well, more often than not, people are actually leaving church again at that point because they realize they weren't going there for themselves. They're going there for their kids, and they really don't, you know, they really do brunch on Sunday and then go to church, so they just don't go to church anymore. Here's the problem with that theory, though. I just looked at it over the last 40 years, the GSS. It only, that theory only holds up during the boomer generation. Younger generations, like people born in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, it's all downhill, man. Like, attendance goes down as people get older now. There's not this trough and peak and up and down like we would expect to see. So we're seeing like that whole, our whole theory of like church attendance and the life cycle has basically been destroyed over the last 20 years or so because the younger generations are not coming back when they hit their 35-year-old peak when they used to. So it's, it's that does not, that, that changes the way the church growth goes, by the way, because like all Protestants are like obsessed with church growth. They're like, just wait till they have kids. They'll be back. And the data says, not anymore. You, you need to rethink that. Thanks for that, Ryan. That's cheery. Um, <laughs> one last question. Then we'll, we'll continue the conversation during the, the fam. So one last question. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, hi, thank you for being here. I just had a quick question. So we see that the faith of, uh, future of faith is seen to be individ, individual, individualistic, sorry, based on individual preferences. So like Ms. Oakes said, I think we should see how we can involve them back into the church. But in academia, we're sort of talking about now how there's a big toxicology or toxic, toxicity between othering. And so do, do you guys think that by saying the nuns is sort of toxic and setting us back in the thought of bringing them back to the church and bringing them back into just, not even just churches, but just into the Christian community. Yeah, I agree with Tara that the term is really problematic because it's, and most of the people I profiled in my book are, were really hated being called nuns because it's a negation of, it just starts with um, nothing, right? And so um, it's sort of like, that's why they, dislike the term. I, I, dis I dislike it too. I often say religiously unaffiliated um, instead of nuns, but now we're stuck with it. Um, like we're stuck with Gen X and millennial. Nobody likes being called either of those things. So um, I think that uh, it is the, the danger of othering again, and it is that, that us and them kind of uh, dynamic is really problematic and this is why I was critical of Bishop Barron earlier because a lot of what he says about the nuns is very clerical and it's from a clerical point of view and I really wish that he would spend more time actually with them and elevating their voices rather than telling them what they should think and what they should do. That's a uniquely kind of Catholic problem, I think. But I think that um, 
just on a personal level at, at Berkeley, um, you know, it's a very secular school in one of the most secular states. And that my students have this great, um, incredible depth of spiritual wisdom and, and seeking and, and a thirst for spiritual um, food that's not being met. So there you go. Well, thank you. Please join me in thanking our uh, parents. <laughs>